Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you again for your goodness to us today. Thank you, Lord, for your mercy and, Lord, for your wonderful grace. We thank you, Lord, that the victory is ours and that, Lord, the devil is a defeated foe. Lord, I pray you'll bless our Sunday school hour. Lord, I pray for those who could not be here today. Some called this morning, said that they were sick. And Lord, we do pray for them. Lord, I know that some have to work. Lord, we do pray for them. But, Lord, we're here, and we really do need a blessing. And, Lord, we ask that you would bless us today and encourage us this morning. Lord, with thy presence, Lord, how we need thee. I think of that song, I need thee, oh, I need thee every hour, I need thee. Lord, again, we thank you for watch care protection, Lord. I know that many do a lot of traveling, and uh, Lord, but we're thankful, Lord, that we are here safe and sound today. Lord, bless, we pray in the few minutes we have. Really, our, our time's going to be gone, and, and Lord, help us to learn something, to get something. Uh, Lord, today we pray in Jesus' name, amen, and amen. All right, while you are uh, looking at those, there are the Ten Commandments, and I'll tell you, I'll tell you what I, I will do. Since this is the first time, this will not be the last time that you see this particular quiz on the Ten Commandments, all right? I will help you today with these. I'll give you, for example, number one says, Thou shalt have no, and I'll give you, uh, the last word is me. And that one, the last word is me. Thou shalt have no, well, fill in, fill it in. Oh, fill it in. No, write it. I'm sorry, write it. You need something to write with? Everybody's got something. Fill those out real quick, Lee. All right, quickly. And then we will start. Number two, I'll give you one word. Uh, last word is image. Last word in number two is image. And number three, uh, I'll give you the last word in that is vain. V A I N, vain. And number four, uh, I'll give you the last word is holy. Number four is holy. Last word in that sentence is holy. I'm not going to give you number five at all. Uh, I will tell you this. Uh, you should be able to get number six. Number seven is not, thou shalt not. <clears throat> number eight. Uh, number nine, I'll give you the last word, is witness. The last word in number nine is witness. And I'll just tell you number ten, thou shalt not. Okay? Okay. Thou shalt not, all right? So you try and figure those out. Again, this will not be the last time that you see this exact quiz uh, for the Ten Commandments. We want to have a study, start a study on the Ten Commandments in Sunday school. Say a few things about those, but I'll give you a minute just to do this. Oh, uh, the Ten Commandments, all right? The Ten Commandments. If... While you're doing that, I'm going to get my glasses. Everybody's got it? Very good. Here's, here's what the answers are to the Ten Commandments. Number one is thou shalt not, oh, I'm sorry, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Number two, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. Number three, thou shalt not, uh, I know the answer, uh, thou shalt not use the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Number four, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Number five, honor thy father and thy mother. Number six, thou shalt not kill. Number seven, thou shalt not commit adultery. Number eight, thou shalt not steal. Number nine, thou shalt not bear false witness. And number ten, thou shalt not covet. How many got them all right? Oh, 
All right. Good. Well, the rest of us, we're going to work on it then. All right. Turn your Bibles to Exodus chapter 20 today. Exodus chapter 20 is where we'll start. Exodus chapter 20. Exodus 20 on the Ten Commandments. John. Yep. Luke. Luke did. Luke wrote Acts. Luke wrote the book of Acts. All of it. Why do you ask? The, no, yeah. First half, how many, quickly, how many chapters are there in the book of Acts? 28. Of those 28, the majority are about Paul, all right, learning our Bible. In what chapter of Acts is Paul saved? Nine. Chapter 9, all right? But in chapter 10, we're still talking about Peter. All right, the first 11 chapters, the first 11 chapters, 12 chapters, first 12 chapters are about Peter because in Acts chapter 12, we find the story of, uh, or the account of Herod trying to behead or try to kill Peter. And, and remember that account where the two angels, or the angel came and woke Peter up, and he escaped out of the city safe. In chapter 13, then, we begin to find the account of Paul. So in the book of Acts, the first 12 chapters are, are associated with Peter. And then from chapter 13 through chapter 28, uh, it is about the travels and the missionary journeys of the apostle Paul. All right? So Luke wrote that. All right? Now, let me just say, I was watching a guy on TV the other day, and he said, turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 19. That's correct. There is no chapter 19. Just seeing if you're awake. All right. So we know the first, and I'm going to get this, the first four books of the New Testament are the Gospels, and they are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and followed by a book of history, which is the book of Acts. Then we have the 13 books that Paul wrote, the church epistles. Somebody said, what's an epistle? It's a good question. It is merely, in a, le it's merely a letter. And then we have the general epistles written by John, written by Peter, written by Jude. Uh, and then we have the book of Revelation. Yeah, Ken. Okay. Uh, all the books that Paul wrote, yes, and then we figure that he wrote Hebrews too, but Hebrews doesn't start the way he starts all the rest of them. That's exactly, that is the one, one great argument why he didn't write it. Because what is their reasoning for, for him writing it? Toward the end of the book, in Hebrews, some of the things that the writer says resemble a great deal of things that Paul said earlier. And that is one of the compelling arguments that he wrote it. If somebody said, well, what do you think? One of the arguments, as Ken made note of, every book that Paul wrote, in the very first verse, second verse, he identifies himself, who he is. It does not say that in the book of Hebrews. One of the reasons that some have suggested is that because it was written to the Jews, and Paul had a really bad reputation with the Jews. Now, it's written to believers, but that is one of the arguments that Paul wrote it, but that he did not put his name in it. Chapters 13, there are things in chapter 13 that would make you think that Paul wrote it. I don't know. The other option is that Apollos wrote it. Apollos was very eloquent, but the Bible does not say who it was, so I guess we'll just let this surmise it. In the New Testament, in the New Testament, how many books are there? 27, which means there are how many in the old? 39. It, here's, here's what I, once you've learned the books of the New Testament in order, and I know that everybody has, 
Now the next thing to learn is what they're about. Just a general and how many chapters there are. There are 28 chapters in the book of Acts. How many chapters are there in the book of Romans? 16. How many chapters are there in the book of Jude? One. Very good. Trick question. But just, you know, familiarize yourself with the Bible. All right. In Exodus chapter 20 is where we find the Ten Commandments. Now, briefly, we'll say this, that in the Old Testament, that if you read the book of Numbers and Leviticus and the book of Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy means second law, which simply means much of Deuteronomy is a repeat of Leviticus and Numbers and even some of Exodus, where God gives the law. God did not merely give Ten Commandments to the Jews. There are 662 or 663 or 661 laws that God gave to Israel that they were to follow. Now, it is obvious, hold your place right there, look if you would at Romans chapter um, 3, Romans chapter 3, Romans chapter 3 for a moment, Romans chapter 3. Romans 3, it tells us in verse 19. Now we know, Romans 3, verse 19, now we know that what things soever the law saith, and, and we can equate that to the Ten Commandments or to all 660-some laws. Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped. Every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. What the law really proves to us is that we are incapable of keeping it. Nobody, nobody can. Verse 20, therefore by the deeds of the law, and we'll just say the Ten Commandments. If you could keep the Ten Commandments, and you can, nobody can. Therefore by the deeds of the law there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of of sin. Jump over real quick, Galatians, book of Galatians, and chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1. Again, Paul, Paul was a great one, and we ought to be great for grace. All right? And Galatians, Galatians, chapter, we'll look at chapter 2, verse 16. I said chapter 1, but chapter 2, verse 16. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law. People who tell you and, and who have the idea, you know, well, I try to keep the Ten Commandments. I try to keep the Ten Commandments. And that's fine. I'm glad you do. But keeping the Ten Commandments will never, ever, ever ever get a person to heaven. Now, now, Paul does say this, that if righteousness could come by the law, then the law that God gave was excellent. But righteousness does not come by the law. Verse 16 again, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified there's that word justified by the works of faith of Christ. Now, let me slow down. By the work, I'm going to slow down, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. Again, Paul states, for by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. Nobody can be justified by the Ten Commandments. Okay, John asked the question. Grace. Right. Right. Okay. All right. Alex.
Right. Okay. All right. So the, the question is, are we under the Old Testament law? And here's the thing. And, and, and Connie says, yes, we are. We are under. Now, again, as Alex brought out, there are three parts to the law in the Old Testament. The ceremonial law where they took the Passover lamb and, and they uh, offered it up once a year. Well, we know that that's done away with because in the book of Hebrews it says that Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. The ceremonial law is done away with. We don't have to go down to the temple, and we don't have to, uh, every time you commit a sin, because in the Old Testament under the ceremonial law, when you did something wrong, you had to go down and offer up a, a sacrifice for it. Or, if you'll remember, the, the, the lepers. Look at Mark chapter 1 for a moment. We're, we're going to get to Genesis, but look at Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1. We're going to get back to Exodus in a minute. Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1. And in verse 44, here we find the, the account of, of the leper who was healed. So in verse 44, Jesus then says, And saith unto him, See thou say nothing to any man, but go thy way, show thyself to the priest, and offer for thy cleansing those things which Moses commanded for testimony unto them. I forget what it was. It was something like uh, of some uh, doves or pigeons that, that if you were cleansed from leprosy, and I'll guarantee you when that guy showed up that the priest would have been shocked because there is no really an account of anybody ever being healed from leprosy other than Naaman. Now, but the ceremonial law, if you were whatever, you committed a sin, some kind. Well, you got to go down and offer up. The ceremonial law, the dietary law. And in the dietary law, there are, I, I would say there are clothing laws. For example, you cannot wear wool and cotton. You cannot put an ass and an ox in the same yoke. I mean, that was against the law to do that. You couldn't do that. Uh, you couldn't eat pork. Uh, couldn't eat catfish. Um, that was a dietary law. Couldn't, uh, couldn't do that. And look real quick at the book of Acts, and I'm going to tell you it's Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10. And verse 9, Acts 10, 9. Peter is sleeping. He's hungry. They're fixing lunch. And he's up on the rooftop, and he has a vision. Verse 9. Uh, it says, verse 10, And when he became very hungry and would have eaten, but while they made ready, he fell into a trance and saw heaven opened, and a certain vessel descending unto him, as it had been a great sheet, knit at the four corners and let down to the earth, wherein were all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth and wild beasts and creeping things, and fowls of the air. And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice spake unto him again the second time, What well, God hath cleansed, that call not thou common. This was done thrice. And the vessel was received up again into heaven. Verse 17, Now while Peter doubted in himself the vision, which he had seen should mean, behold, the men which were sent from Cornelius had made inquiry for Simon's house and stood before the gate. Now, most people have this to believe, take this to believe that the dietary law was really done away with. Now, there were some guys who came. One second. Go ahead. Um, heard reference to this where it's the emphasis Jesus was making about this situation is what went to your belly it was what went into your heart it was more faith and so he's pointing out that it's not what you eat anymore it's what your 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 faith and your belief in Christ all right here and and what happened is Cornelius some men from Cornelius came he was a Gentile one of the things that was against the law 
a Jew could not eat with a Gentile. If I remember the law correctly, you couldn't even go under their house. Jews consider the Gentiles dogs. And you really could not. That's why the Jews hated the Samaritans so badly, because they were half Gentile and half Jew, and the Jews hated the Samaritans. Now, Cornelius, the men from Cornelius come, and I, Peter understands that what the Lord is saying. Peter went on over to Cornelius' house. He was a Gentile. But the dietary law, and what we read some, about what Connie said, we read, I believe it's in Romans chapter 14, that which is not of faith is sin. All right, so it's not so much what we eat anymore. So the dietary law and the ceremonial law, all the trappings that went along with it, everything, the robes that the priest wore, the, the, the design, the design of the temple, the design of the tabernacle, uh, everything that had to do with the law, the ceremonial law, and the dietary law, that was done away with. Also, um, in Paul chastised Peter because of circumcision. He would, he kind of was a hypocrite. He went back to by the men, you know, he acted the same way he did with the men around them because that, he wanted to be accepted. Right. But he wasn't really accepting what Christ offered for him. And Peter was hypocritical. The Bible, Paul says that I withstood him face to face because he had gone to Cornelius' house, and then there were some other Jews, and then he said, well, and then Peter got all fouled up with the Jewish-Gentile whole situation. Paul withstood him face to face and said, you know, if you're going to be a Jew, be a Jew, but if he's going to be Gentile, and so that whole Jewish-Gentile thing and, and is done away with now, for there is nothing... Uh, Bible says, for there's nothing in and of itself that is unclean. If you want to eat snakes, hey, did you hear about the guy last week? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no. Oh, okay. Let me tell you. There, I think he was, I don't know where it was, West Virginia? He died. The rattlesnake handler. Yeah, he, got, he was handling snakes in church, and he got bit. Yeah, he's been bitten before, but this time, I guess he really laid into him, I guess. I don't know, but I guess he had no faith. That's why he died. Yeah, he didn't go. To, he refused treatment, and he died. But uh, anyway, John. not to go to the Gentiles, but to preach only to the Jews. And I was, I was a little uh, miffed, not really miffed, but I, I was confused about the fact that the 12 apostles did continue to preach to the Jews, but they did it out of the Old, old uh, Testament. They, they, they still uh, considered themselves and the Jewish people under the law, the old law. Here's the apostles. Here's what Jesus said. Acts 1, verse 8. But ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Judea and Samaria, and in Jerusalem, and Judea, and Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. All right? Question. Did they do that? Until Acts chapter 4 when great persecution came to the church, and they, were, they went everywhere preaching the word. Now, Thomas, and I, again, I know a lot, it, how much you can base on, Thomas died in India. He wasn't preaching to the Jews there. He died in India. They shot him full of arrows. Uh, the apostle Paul went to the Gentiles for sure, because, and he died in Rome, and um, all Paul's letters, most of Paul's letters are to the Gentiles. The only John, the Apostle John, went to Ephesus. He was, I believe that is where he was when he was taken prisoner, then exiled to Patmos at least for a while. Uh, the, the disciples stayed in Jerusalem at first, as far as I can tell, 
The ones that stayed after the persecution were James. And Peter went evidently to Babylon, what we would know as Babylon. Where is Babylon? Anybody know where Babylon is? Iraq. Iraq. That's, where, that's where he went. And so the, at first they went. As you read the book of Acts, and Alex mentioned this, as you read the book of Acts, the book of Acts is a book of transition. And it is transitioning from law to grace. If you'll read it, when the, the Holy Spirit came on the disciples, they tarried there. When it came on the Jews, they tarried. When it came on the Samaritans, they prayed over them, and the Holy Spirit came upon them. Upon the Gentiles, when they believed, the Holy Spirit came immediately. The book of Acts is from law to grace. Jesus said to Peter, he said, I give unto you the keys of the kingdom. Now, Peter exercised the use of the keys of the kingdom to both Jews and Gentiles. When he preached at Pentecost, there were many Jews there, and many Jews got saved. And so he turned the key for the Jews to enter into the kingdom. For the Gentiles, in Acts chapter 10, when Peter went to Cornelius, who was an Italian, who was a Gentile, he went there, and he turned the key, and he opened the door for Gentile believers. The Macedonian, in a vision, said to Paul, come over here and help us. And Paul went into Europe, went over into Greece, went over that way to the Gentiles. And so the church, while it had a Jewish, we call it Judeo-Christian, but while it had a Jewish background, and part, as you read the book of Galatians, you will find that there were Judaizers who had come into the church and said that you have to keep the Old Testament law in order to be saved. Paul proved that wrong. Said that you do not have to keep the Old Testament law, that we are now in the age of grace. In our reading there in Galatians chapter 2, knowing this, that a man is not justified by the works or by the deeds of the law, but by the faith of Christ. All right. What does is, what is justified mean? What does justified mean? If I say that I'm justified, uh, or Romans chapter 4, I believe it's verse, uh, chapter 5 and verse 1, therefore being justified by grace through faith, we have peace. What does it mean that we are justified? What does that mean, I'm justified? If you're saved today, what does it mean that you're justified? Reconciled to God. Reconciled to God. Any questions? Yes. In the New Testament and also in the Old, they talk about justified. A believer, their household is justified because of their faith. And how's that work? Because, you know, I mean, when the spies okay. went into the... You know, promised land, and right. her household was saved by her faith. Now, how does that really work? Because okay. we talk about the New Testament, too. Uh, okay. We're not going to get to Gen Exodus 20. Look at Acts for a minute, chapter 16. Acts chapter 16. Acts 16. In Acts chapter 16, we find the founding, the beginning of the church of the Philippians. Paul wrote a book there. This is how the church at, of the Philippians started. Started with a, a uh, demon-possessed girl. Started with Dorcas, I believe it says, um, in chapter or Lydia in verse 14. Verse 14, we find Lydia. And then in verse 16, a spirit-possessed damsel that they cast out. And then in, at, the, at the end of the chapter... Paul and Silas are in jail, and they are preaching, or singing. Verse 25, and at midnight Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. They were prisoners in jail because of their faith. They prayed, and they sang. Nobody knows the trouble I've seen. That isn't what they were singing. They were saying, thank you, Lord. Now, there was a great earthquake in verse 26, so that the foundation of the prison 
were shaken immediately. All the doors were open, and everyone's bands were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, awakening out of his sleep, and seeing the prison doors open, he drew his sword. If you read chapter 12 of Acts, you'll find that when Peter escaped, when he escaped, they, they killed the guards because he escaped. In chapter 28 of Matthew, when Jesus arose from the dead, the guards came into town, and they said, here's what happened. And the priest said, if this come to Pilate's ears, we will give him money. Because they were liable. This guy, when the doors were opened, was going to kill himself because he was responsible. But now notice, Paul cried with a loud voice saying, verse 28, do thyself no harm for we are all here. Then he called for a light and sprang in. The, the place where Paul and Silas, the place where Paul and Silas was, was a kind of a hole in the ground if we understand it to be right. That's why it says he sprang in. Now, and fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved and thy house. Here's a question about covenant theology. I'll just take anybody in here. The question is about Rahab. Rahab, of course, was a harlot. When the spies came to Jericho, she hid them and said, if you don't destroy us, I will hide you. And the spies said, when we come into this town, hang the scarlet cord in the window. And he said, anybody that's in your house will not be killed. All right? Now, as, as we know, Rahab eventually married uh, a Jewish person, and, and Lord Christ came through that line. The question is, if mom and dad get saved, does that mean that the kids are going to get saved? That they are immediately, and I think maybe your question is, if mom and dad get saved, does that mean that the kids are saved? Is that your question? Well, it, it says several times uh, in the New Testament also, they are justified in their whole house or saved. Okay, all right. I don't know if that, you know, it just says, it doesn't mean, I guess in my mind, they automatically, they believe, but they're well, justified. Well, here, here is the thing. All right, when we read chapter 16, Paul said, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. And they spake unto him the word of the Lord, and to all that were in his house. All right, so that somebody says, Well, see, it says there in that verse that if the Philippian would believe that he would be saved, and so would his house. But that isn't exactly what happened. He said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. And, it, and, and as I read it, and if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou art saved, and the people in your house believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and they are saved, they'll be saved. Because it says in that next verse, and they spake unto him the word of the Lord, and to all that were in his house. Because here's the, the gospel truth, that faith cometh by what? Hearing. And hearing by the word of God. All right, so as it says in that verse, Paul preached to them the word of the Lord and all that were in the house, and he took them, the jailer took them the same night and washed their stripes and was baptized, he and all his straightway. Here's my thing about that is that they had to believe that when, when dad came home, and said, you need to hear what these guys have to say. Uh, I know it's not true of every case, but I, I am a firm believer that if dad, if dad gets saved, if dad gets saved, now it doesn't always, I know it doesn't always, but if dad gets saved, and then mom gets saved, that the kids will get saved. Now, it doesn't always work that way. I know it doesn't always work that way. There are exceptions to the rule. But the only way, the only way 
that a person can be saved and be justified is by faith in the Word of God. Now, I'm thinking, uh, look at 1 Peter. Look at 1 Peter for a minute. 1 Peter chapter, uh, I believe it's chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. Um, verse 1. It's talking about husbands and wives. In 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 1. Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. That does not mean, does not, the conversation there does not mean a continual, constant nagging of the husband to get saved. Conversation there means their lifestyle. It says in verse 2, while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear, the unsaved husband sees what happens to his wife and can be won by her. Now, let me say quickly, real quickly. I don't believe in lifestyle evangelism. That guy's going to get saved because I live a good life. Now, he may observe my good life, he may take note of my good life, but that does not mean that he is going to be saved because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. But if people say, you know what, there's something different about that guy. There's something really different about that woman. There's something different about my wife. I don't know what happened to my wife, but something happened. And I can say that about my father. When my father got saved, I did not understand what was going on the night my dad got saved. I did not know. I just remember him walking and my mother walking down the aisle to the front of the church. I did not understand what was going on. But I can tell you this, that something happened to my father that night. And he was never the same again. Never the same. And people say, what happened to that Jenkins guy? He got, re he got, you know, I looked up, he got religion. He got religion. But he got something, I'll guarantee you that. And so, uh, Here's what I'd like you to do, Connie. Next Sunday. I want you to bring me those verses so I can look at them. Okay. Yeah, that's all right. I know how that is. I have nothing on the top of my head either, but, uh, you know, so it's like, um, it's like, uh, you know, you, 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 I always think when I'm talking, I always think good verses after the situation's over. But uh, all right, look back at Exodus chapter 20. Exodus 20. We, we'll get started on this today. I thought we'd get farther than what we did, but Exodus 20. Exodus chapter 20. So we are not under the dietary law. We are not under the ceremonial law. We are under the moral law. The moral law says I can't get a gun out and shoot John just because I feel like it. One of, the, one of the Ten Commandments is, Thou shalt not kill. Now, there are other moral commandments other than those in the Ten Commandments. For example, we, there was were, were somebody who used to come to church here. They don't come to church anymore because they think that we are very unloving toward people who are dare I use the word gay. I don't think they are. They're, they have one of the highest suicide rates in the country. I'm not unloving toward them. Uh, we want to see everybody saved. But you got to call it like it's written in the Bible. I mean, it, 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 it's a sin. It's a moral sin. The Bible makes it clear that it's a sin. It's an abomination against God. For men to be with men, women to be with women. It's a sin. That's what it is. Now, that's the moral law. It's not the ceremonial law. It's not the dietary law. It is the moral law. And we are under obligation as believers in Christ to be under the moral law. In America, despite what, and I, you see these nitwits on TV all the time, America is not a Christian nation. America never was a Christian nation. 
that, that's a lie. That's just uh, uh, history revisionism. That's a lie. America was founded on Christian principles. America was founded in a great part by people who were Christians. Now, I know that not everybody was. Georgia was founded by a bunch of convicts. Uh, I, I know that. Maryland uh, uh, and uh, well, Virginia, uh, they were just different churches. Somebody said, well, they were all Christians. No, they weren't all Christians. But anyway, America was, and the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence is written with a firm belief in God. The Bible says this in our reading, thou shalt have no other gods. If God is not God, then there is no God. All right? If God is not God, then there is no God. There, there's no God. Well, what about the Mohammeds? What about the Buddhists? What about, I'm telling you, if God is not God, then there is no God at all. None. All these other, but anyway. So we are under the moral law. America was founded on the moral law. The Ten Commandments are written on the Supreme Court, on the face of the Supreme Court of the building. We are not. We are under a moral law. In the New Testament, Jesus emphasized every one of the moral laws except the Sabbath day. Now, he went down to the Sabbath day. The Bible says, as was his custom. Jesus customarily went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day. Now, we know this, that we're not under the law. We're not under the Sabbath day law. And again, I remind you that the Sabbath day was a direct sign between God and Israel. I know that there are the Seventh-day Adventists. I know there are Seventh-day Baptists. I, I know that the Jehovah's Witnesses uh, worship on the seventh day. There are a lot of seventh day, but we are not under that seventh-day Sabbath sign. There are those who will tell you that people who worship on Sunday, that is the mark of the beast. Anybody who worships on Sunday is the mark of the beast. Now look, the Bible indicates to us that upon the first day of the week, well, to us, this is the first day of the week. It's not the last day of the week. It's the first day of the week. And so we worship on Sunday. But Jesus emphasized every one of the Ten Commandments other than remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. But Jesus himself did that because we are not under the Sabbath law. We are under the moral law. Now, chapter 20. God spake all these words, say. All right, who did he speak these words to, first of all? Who did God speak these to? Moses, all right? Where was Moses? On the mount. It probably, according to what Paul said in the book of Galatians, that this Mount Sinai was in the Arabian Peninsula. That's where they were. All right, so they were on Mount Sinai. Moses was on Mount Sinai. Question, who went up there with him? Joshua did go up. Now, he didn't go all the way to the top. That's true. But Joshua did go up because you'll remember when they came down in chapter 32, and Joshua said, that sounds like war down, going on down there in the camp. And Moses said, that's not the sound of war going on down there. They're having some kind of party. And so uh, Joshua had gone up there with him, but he, Joshua did not go all the way. And so God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which hath brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image, or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them, for I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Here's what, God, here's what the Bible says about God. Our God is a merciful God. God is merciful. Now, verse 7, And thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. That's a good principle even for today. Look, you, you may not be able to take Sunday off. Okay, so you can't take Sunday off. You ought to find one day during the week that you can take off 
and that you have a day to rest. Somebody has rightly said that if you don't come apart, you'll come apart. And so you need to take some time, have a day where you just rest. Now, it says in verse 10, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work. Thou, uh, thou let me slow down, thou nor thy son nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor the, thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth. There he repeats that. There he's got that principle. In six days God created the heaven and the earth, and the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day, and howled it. Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land, which the Lord thy God giveth thee. That is the first commandment that has a promise to it. Want to live a long time? Honor your mother, mother and father. Pay respect. Even, even, even. Now, I realize, I'll back up and say this. I realize this is what the Bible says in Genesis chapter 1. Therefore shall a man leave his mother and father and cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one. When you grow up, and get married, when you grow up and get married, when you grow up and get married. Somebody says, well, preacher, do you ever grow up enough? No, you never grow up enough. But anyway, and I don't think I'm talking to, I'm not, I'm preaching to the choir, I know that. You need to leave home. You need to get out of the house. You need to go start your own. I know, well, times are tough. They're always tough. Uh, but you need to find your own place. You need to, and I'm just telling you, some of you in here aren't. You need to find your own place. Have your own place. Don't live with mom and dad. Don't sponge off of them. But anyway, honor thy father and mother. All right, you want to live a long time? Now, I, I, I'm starting to say this. Even after you have moved out, you should respect your mom and your dad, giving them honor because they are your mom and dad. And I will, Paul says this. Now, there was no Social Security in the Bible. None. There was no Social Security in this country. I don't know if I told you, but I hit lotto this week. I got my first Social Security check. But anyway, um, the, um, there was no Social Security. And, and 150 years ago, if the husband died, Usually the woman remarried because there wasn't anything to take care of. Now look, if today, if today your father were to die, it is your responsibility, maybe not to take mom into your home, because no house is big enough for two women. Um, I found that out. Not my wife and I, but my grandmother came to live with us. My mother wound up a psychiatrist. But anyway, uh, no house big enough for two women. But it is, it is, fellas, your responsibility to make sure that your mother is provided for. Because the Bible says that if you do not provide for your own, you are worse than an infidel. Now, I'm not saying you need to bring mom into your house and, and live there. Um, with, with you. I mean, if you got a room with bars on the door to separate you from the other, but, you know, and you can put her back there, and, and she has her own room and her own kitchenette and watch her own TV, and, you know, maybe you see her once in a month, but, you no, know, I'm just, if, if that's the case, you know, as difficult as it is sometimes, you know, I, I would, I am. Yeah, I know. If, if we had to, and I don't think we'd ever have to, but I mean, I, I would not, I would not. And Carol and I have talked about this. You know what would have really been rough is if my father-in-law had died and my mother-in-law had come to live with us and then my mother would have died and my father would have come. It would have been like an <laughs> atomic explosion going off. But anyway, I, I would not, I'm not going to leave anybody in my family, that ain't gonna happen. We, we'd take my mother's biggest concern, her biggest fear in life, 
was that she would have to live in New York. I kept telling her, what's so bad about this? She goes, well, it's cold. I said, well, we do heat. You know, it's not like we don't have heat up there, but uh, um, it is our responsibility. Well, now, it says, honor, verse 13, thou shalt not kill. That's talking about premeditated, cold-blooded murder. We'll talk about that when we get to it. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Paul makes it clear, let him that stole steal no more. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. In other words, don't lie. We're not to lie. Verse 17, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. Now, covetousness, and we'll talk about it when we get to it. We're about out of time. Covetousness is the desire to have something else that somebody has. It's to want something that somebody else has. Now, as you read down through those Ten Commandments, if you still have those papers, you'll note this. Number one, thou shalt have no. Verse two, thou shalt not. Verse three, thou shalt not. Verse four is a positive, remember. Verse five, honor thy father and mother. Verse six, thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Thou shalt not covet. The majority of the Ten Commandments have a negative. Thou shalt not. All right? Don't do this. The commandments are divided into two parts. The first four commandments are our responsibility toward God. For example, thou shalt have no other gods before me. All right, that, that is our responsibility toward God. Thou shalt not use the name of the Lord thy God in vain. All right, that is my responsibility. And we've talked about that, about saying, oh, my God, or God, oh, God. Jesus said this, uh, don't swear by heaven nor by earth. Oh, my stars. No, they're not your stars. They're not yours. Now, look, thou shalt not uh, use the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Uh, verse two, number two, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. An idol. Uh, number four, uh, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. So the first four commandments are our responsibility toward God. What is it that we are to do toward God? The last six are our responsibility toward men. It says, honor thy father and thy mother. That's what we're supposed to do. Thou shalt not kill. That's not We're not supposed to kill. We're not, and, and we'll talk about this when we get to it. Somebody said, is there justifiable? Is there justifiable murder? Is there justifiable? Is it? No, there's no justifiable murder. Is there justifiable homicide? We'll see it when we get there. Um, thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Thou shalt not covet. And so the second six commandments are my responsibility toward man. Now, in the New Testament, somebody asked Jesus, what, how, how could we sum up the whole Old Testament law? How could we, all 600 points, how could we combine it into one sentence? And that sentence is what? Right there. Love thy neighbor. Right there. All Ten Commandments. All 600 are found in that. To love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, all thy soul, all thy mind, and all that is within thee. And the second is like under the first. To love thy neighbor as thyself. Right there. First four, our responsibility to God. The last six, our responsibility toward men. We're going to start on it next week. Let's pray. Father, we thank you again. Lord, for the opportunity one more time to open this thy book, thy word. Help us to study it, to know it. Lord, may it be a part of us if we are going to truly love God and we are going to have to study the scriptures. So, Lord, we pray that you'll bless now. Lord, bless our next hour. Again, we thank you for the opportunity to be here. Lord, bless, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.